All right, so joining me now is the president of the aforementioned Green Oceans Group. We welcome her for the first time in the dugout. So stepping to the plate, we'll welcome Lisa Quatrachi, Dr. Quatrachi. Welcome, Quatrachi. Welcome to the dugout. Thank you. It's great being here. I've learned some things that the public doesn't know. And my personal belief is that the public is better at making decisions if they have the information than our politicians. And unfortunately, right now, we don't have the information. And so they clearly didn't want the public to read this environmental impact statement. They made it very yeah. difficult. It was over 2,000 pages. I have three daughters and worried about the world that they're going to inherit. And so I read this this impact statement and thought, oh my gosh, I don't know. The devil is in the details here. I don't know if people realize what's going on. And so I invited about 60 plus neighbors to come over to my house and I gave a little PowerPoint presentation. And at the end, and I asked if anybody knew anything more than this. And at the end, everyone said, oh my gosh, we need to form a group and Lisa, you need to be the head. So well, that's how it happened. You can be either for or against climate change, you know, adjustments. But at the same time, you can be against offshore wind because they're, they're kind of separate issues, right? You can have concerns about the climate, but at the same time, you don't have to just swallow everything the government and the activists are trying to tell you about offshore wind. Would you agree? Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I mean, I don't think very many people who believe in solar farms would want us to cut down the redwood forest in order to put up solar farms <clears throat> or anybody who believes in wind power would want to put it right in the middle of the Grand Canyon. But this is what we're doing, essentially, because the NOAA, the um, the agency that's supposed to protect our marine resources, has deemed the area off of Rhode Island and Massachusetts as a habitat of particular concern. And yet we are putting nine projects that are going to extend over 1,400 square miles into this particular, or this habit, this yeah. precious habitat. Just to be clear, right? There's a few bunch of projects being proposed, right? You're just focusing on revolution wind? Well, for our state lawsuit, yes. Revolution Wind was in the same lease area as another project called South Fork Wind, and they're yeah. both smack dab covering Cox's Ledge. And Cox's Ledge is one of the prime, it's one of the last remaining spawning grounds for Southern New England cod, and it is a winter foraging habitat for five endangered whale species. And it is an incredibly biodiverse, rich area for fishing. And it is a very crucial, very special part of the ocean. Now, did I, am I mistaken or did I read somewhere that if all the projects down the road get approved, we're talking maybe 10 times more than the 77 or 85 windmills you're talking oh, yeah. about? It could about reach a thousand. A thousand, right? Yeah, about a thousand. These turbines are 800 to 1,000 feet tall, taller than any building, for instance, as you say in your release in, in downtown Boston. But the other thing that I have wanted to emphasize is this is all about the negative parts of the project. They've never proven that the projects are going to help climate change. They've never proven that the projects are going to reduce carbon dioxide emissions, and they've never proven that they're going to they're going to wean us off fossil fuels. The purpose and need of these projects is merely to allow states to reach their mandates for renewable energy. So uh, this is the area off of Rhode Island. You can see the coast up here. And this is a massive area. It looks like it's almost as big as Rhode Island. This is just to show how big these turbines are. So there's the lighthouse way down there. That's right, kind of, which is pretty good size, and then here's the turbine. My goodness, it is. Right. And it they've is. never been tested in the wind power or wind speeds that we have, sort of regularly here in the Northeast. And they don't tell you how many hundreds of gallons of diesel, six hundred gallons per turbine of diesel fuel, all the lubricants, all the other the coolants all the chemicals that are bad for the environment and bad for the atmosphere okay, within each. The environment. 
Well, that's what they want you to think. They don't want you to read the environmental yeah. impact statement. Right. And this is a prime fishing area as well as an environmentally sensitive area, right? For wildlife and sea life. Right. And but you can see that it's not just the turbine placement. It is also the inter-array cables. They jet plow in order to dig down four to six feet deep. The jet plow actually resuspends sediment that has been accumulating there for over hundreds of years. So Rhode Island during the Industrial Revolution wasn't particularly careful about what it dumped into its West Passage and the Seconic River. Now we're gonna be resuspending all of that stuff and putting it back into the water column, allowing it to get back into our, our fisheries and our food chain. And yet the, comp the federal government nor the state government has asked the companies to make core samples to determine what kind of toxins are in that. They've asked that them- has, to, That has not been done? It has not been done. And I just wanted to point out that if whales evolved 50 million years ago when the planet was almost 10 degrees warmer Celsius than it is today. And they have- The planet, spent, or, the planet or the oceans? Well, this is the planet. It's not the ocean. But one would assume that there's some sort of equilibrium between them. Yeah. So so, yeah. so these minor changes in ocean temperatures, they're saying, aren't going to impact whales. No, but that's but everything else really we're going to talk about does. Yeah. This our Jody Stone's a friend of our show. She, you've probably seen her on. I don't know if you do social media, but I was I was curious about this language. Noah approves. Yes. The killing of endangered. So so they literally do. Yes. Yes. They say it's okay because it's small. Limited, number. Lim limited number. Yeah. The problem is they evaluate every single one of these projects in isolation. They have never done a programmatic review where they put them all together and say, oh, by the way, how many are we actually getting? Yeah. With these right. cakes? One, yeah. Yeah. I got now. They also mentioned is this is, this, is, is Noah something under Gina Raimondo at the U.S. Department of Commerce? Yes. Because you know nothing happens without the director's approval. So here is the former governor of Rhode Island now working, running a federal agency, approving the killing of sea life off of Rhode Island, her, own, her former state's uh, shore. I mean, not is there anything more to say there? Or well, qualify? Did, I get just, it? did I overstate it? No, and it's not just sea life. It's actually endangered whales. Wow. Endangered okay. species. And that's what people are saying no to. They're saying, no, we're not going to, we are not going to look at this because we already know. And it's not just whales, it's uh, dolphins and, and porpoises. Right. And so these are, these are just the nine projects off of Rhode Island and Massachusetts. This is the number of incidental take authorizations NOAA has granted for the projects combined. The upper number is the amount total and the one the number in parentheses is the level a takes those are the takes that can lead to death so they have basically a lot they have granted these companies permission to kill or to injure to the point of killing 145 whales and this is just one year one year over imagine imagine uh, imagine if there was a um Drilling for oil well in Texas that would produce these numbers. What do you <laughs> what, what do you think would happen? Yeah. Okay. All right. But they even resort to deceptive imagery here. So Orsted had their company give the government one set of visual simulations that are a little bit more accurate and yet release to the public a completely different version of the exact same simulations that had been filtered. Or, or resolved out. differently. Yeah. I don't. I, I can't. I can't say intent, but I think it's very curious. And it's, this, it's, it's clearly deceptive. Whether it was done on purpose deceptive. or not, it's clearly deceptive. I mean, you got to wonder if a company or a government agency has to be so deceptive with the public. What the hell else are they hiding? Right. Uh, offshore wind is, is by far the most expensive form. Not to mention the dangers to the habitat. And sea life and high pollution visual, but by far it's the most expensive form of electricity. Yes. And I find this a regressive tax. So electricity is almost a human right these days. Everyone uses it. We can't do without it. And so who is going to be hurt 
if if electricity prices increase? Well, the elderly, people on fixed incomes, working class, families, those are the people because they're not going to be able to say, OK, I'm not going to use electricity. Their kids need to have their computers. We need um, air conditioning or fans. You know, we're not going to be able to stop using electricity. So this is going to is a regressive form of attacks. But the other thing that we'll do is businesses rely on electricity. If manufacturing, which is very electric, well, it's inflation, and local inflation in our region, no question about right. it. And no businesses, question. I'm, an, I'm an economist. I know all that. I've written and talked about that a lot. That there's, in addition to the national inflation problems we have, that all, all America gets swept up in. We, we make it worse with these crazy energy and electricity and other regulatory policies that cause even higher local inflation than what we're suffering nationally but i but i do know in, in my other readings that the wind doesn't always blow and right. you can't rely whether it's solar because the sun doesn't always shine either or wind on onshore or offshore that because it's not 100 percent reliable ironically ge which sells a lot of wind turbines is now selling single cycle fossil fuel plants along with its turbines because they know people are going to need the fossil fuel backup. So we're going to have to add fossil fuel plants to the grid the more wind we add. The the environmental impact is far worse with these green energy solutions. Um, uh, I don't think there's any question about that. Well, I, I feel like we need to, scientists need to stop trying to persuade the public and try to push political agendas and just inform the public. And I have been a firm believer that if the public has the information at their at their fingertips, if they know what's going on, they're going to make better decisions than any politician. So I'm not criticizing scientists. I am criticizing the fact that what the public the public is not getting the real information. And maybe some scientists are participating in that. Maybe it's the news media, maybe it's the government. I don't know, but I I think that we're not getting the real information. It, it's really stunning how everybody falls lockstep and barrel behind narratives that have no scientific basis. And I think the same thing is happening here with these offshore wind farms. There are these significant questions you're raising here. You're presenting data. Significant questions that nobody seems to want to deal with. The federal agency itself says there will be no influence on climate change from all these projects. The CO2 emissions up front, like you talked about earlier, uh, are, are massive and may never be recovered. And and like you say here, like we talked about a little while ago, without battery storage, um, we're still going to need fossil fuels as a backup. So all these costs, all these problems, all this lack of research without any measurable benefit because I think this is very important too. We have Rhode Island, a significant piece of Rhode Island's economy is based on, on fishing. Uh, the Cox's Ledge is a prime fishing area. We, we know that fishermen and women and the industry have, have, have tried to bring some sanity to this debate. We tried to get some of those fishermen representatives or fishing industry on our show. We, couldn't, we didn't know how to reach the right people. But as I understand it, they left the group Yes. Out of frustration, you don't care about us. You don't, you don't care about fishing. You brought us in here to listen to our opinions, and you've ignored it all. Again, is it just another case of the narrative ruling the day and anybody who's not for it gets canceled? Well, I would love you to talk to some of that. They've actually left. It was called the Fisherman's Advisory Board, and it was a, it. Yeah. It was a, a consulting group to the CRMC, and they were, they were pretty you know, disappointed and disillusioned in the process. So they resigned en masse and many of them have joined our lawsuits. So they have joined both wow. our state and our federal lawsuit. We also have the New England Fishermen Stewardship Association, NEFSA, who is on our lawsuit. And we have another commercial fishing group called Rhoda, which is on our lawsuit, not the state. Those two are on our federal lawsuit. So the fishermen have realized or have have, um, they're going to be really impacted. I mean, it's going to be a major adverse impact to fishermen. And, you know, 
we need fish. And yet we're going to have a major adverse impact on our fishing industry. But yet I'll, I'll say it, the left, the government, they don't care about facts and common sense. They care about uh, whatever the established narrative is. So just to go on the record, Mike, I am a registered Democrat and I okay. always have been. So, okay, yeah. you know, but I think that I feel like I can criticize my own. You know, it's like I don't want someone else, you know, I don't necessarily want somebody else to criticize my mother, but I can. So I feel like the Democratic Party is is not living up to the promises they've made to the average person. Well, and, I, and I'm a registered Republican, but I also I have the same criticisms of my party. Oh, <laughs> well, just thank you. Thank you so much, because one of the things that's happened to us is we've been silenced. And it is a really a wonderful thing to have an opportunity to talk about this. Well, that's why we're here to give voice to those who um, who who have well-reasoned uh, counter narratives to the established uh, government and left wing stories. Dr. Lisa Quatraki, thank you so much for joining us here and in the dugout.